This afternoon, we're just going to have a very at ease session where I'm going to share with you the search in my life for God and for truth that I went through before I came to my encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to share with you some of the comparison between Eastern religions, the doctrine that I embraced as a teacher of yoga and meditation at four universities in Tampa, Florida, and the biblical doctrine I now embrace. And there's some very marked differences between the two that I believe will help us understand the nature of truth better. First of all, let me tell you what motivated me to seek after God in my life. Different people are motivated by different things. Primarily, I was mo motivated by love. I was never afraid of God. I was never afraid of what God might do to me because of my lifestyle prior to salvation. I just simply had an experience in my life that birthed in me a love for God where I just wanted to know my Creator. I had this intense desire to know Him, but I didn't know how to find Him. Now, what precipitated that was a near-death experience. At the age of 19, I had been all involved in rock music. I'd been in a rock band. I played all over Florida and different youth centers and bars across the state. And then I had a near-death experience because of drugs. And I came right up to the threshold. I literally felt or at least I had the impression, I believe it was a literal happening. I felt my spirit leaving my body. I felt the life gather from my legs and my arms to the center of my chest, and then it was going out in a throbbing sensation out into this pulsating darkness and felt very ominous to me. And, and, and certainly I had no answers about what was awaiting me on the other side of death. And so I, I was very frightened at the prospect of leaving the world at that time. Thank God, God somehow intervened. I believe the grace of God rescued me from that terrible experience. But I was never the same. I never fit anymore in the circles that I'd been moving in. Uh, I just saw through the vanity of it all, and I saw that it was not for me, that I wanted truth that endured eternally, and I wanted to find lasting answers. And so in an effort to do that, I left college uh, after about six months in my freshman year and began studying full-time at the feet of an Indian guru named Yogi Bhajan, who heads up a group called Kundalini Yoga, or he did. At this point, he's passed on. He died just a few months ago. But I was very impressed with the intensity of, of self-denial and, and commitment to a purpose that was demonstrated by the people who were involved in this. And uh, they, they would live very disciplined lives. They were very focused on spiritual things. When I got into the depth of it, we would get up every morning at 3.15 in the morning. And the first thing the guru taught us to do in the morning at 3.15 was take a cold shower. He said it stimulated the nervous system. He got that right. <laughs> A cold shower at 3.15 in the morning definitely stimulates the nervous system. But that was supposed to awaken you and prepare you for meditation. And then we would start at 3.30 and we would meditate uh, primarily doing what is called mantra yoga, the chanting of Hindu mantras, for two to three hours up until about 6.30. We would be in some form of meditation, raja yoga, mantra yoga, or what have you. And then the rest of the day was dedicated to various disciplines, the reading of different uh, scriptures. We would read the Quran, the Bible, the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, different religious books of different groups. And there were certain segments of time devoted to that, certain segments of time devoted to Hatha Yoga. So that from 12 to 14 hours a day, we were in solitude. We were seeking after supernatural experiences. And the guru I studied under taught us that if we followed his disciplines and if we really devoted our lives to yoga uh, completely, that we might achieve what he called God consciousness or Christ consciousness. Uh, there's a lot of words for it, a lot of phrases that describe this union with God that was the longing in my heart. He said it may happen in 20 or 30 years, and then again he said it might happen in two or three lifetimes that I may have to come back again and devote myself to these uh, these type of disciplines over and over again 
for two or three lifetimes before I finally achieve release from the cycle of rebirth. Samsara is what the Hindus call it, the cycle of reincarnations into this world. I'm so glad, though, that I found out it doesn't take two or three lifetimes and it doesn't take 20 or 30 years. That if you go by the route outlined in Scripture, you can attain, if you want to call it God consciousness, conscious awareness of the reality of God and a personal relationship with Him instantly by calling on the name of Jesus and receiving Him into your heart. That's all that's necessary. And it's, it's so easy, it seems too easy to some of those that are more oriented toward logic and reason. But anyhow, let me tell you how I found the Lord. I've shared it here at Christian Retreat many times. I was, I was uh, teaching at four universities. I was teaching at the University of South Florida, University of Tampa. I was teaching at uh, Florida Presbyterian. That's where my biggest class was, probably 120, 130 students there. And I was teaching at New College. And I had about 400 students who considered me their guru. And I was running a yoga ashram in Tampa, Florida. So I was very focused, intensely focused. And then an article came out in the Tampa Tribune newspaper. In fact, there's a copy of our article in this book, uh, in the middle of the book, section three. And the article talked about how I was teaching yoga in the various universities and what I believed and what I was promoting in the classes. And I thought it would increase my class attendance. Little did I know that it would alert a local prayer group to begin praying for me on a continuing basis. And they, uh, they cut that article out of the newspaper, pinned it to their prayer board, and assigned somebody to be fasting and praying over me every hour of every day. 24 hours a day, somebody was seeking God in my behalf and asking God to open my eyes to the exclusivity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And during that time, God is an amazing genius at orchestrating events and making them fit together and dovetail and in perfect agreement. And during that time I was being prayed for, you might call it being soaked with intercession, I received a letter from an old friend of mine. Now, Larry and I had both quit Florida State University and gone to study under different gurus for the purpose of finding truth. Well, I get a letter back from Larry, quite unexpected, and it contained ideas that I never thought Larry would embrace. He told me how he'd walked into a church and heard an audible voice say, Jesus is the only way. And he said he was born again at that moment. And the whole letter was about how I had to go through the cross and I had to be born again in order to experience eternal life and union with God. Well, I wrote him back and I said, Larry, I'm very happy for you. I'm very glad that you have found this to be a fulfilling experience. And for you, it could well be the right path. But I cannot confine my belief system to just one religion. I said, I believe that all religions are equally valid paths to the same God. And I was very firm in that reaction. But even after I wrote the letter back to Larry, his words kept weighing on my mind. And I couldn't get away from them. An old country preacher one time told me, he said, Brother, what happened to you is the hounds of heaven got on your trail. <laughs> Well, I don't know about hounds in heaven, but I just couldn't get the letter off of my mind. And finally, being a seeker for truth, I had to be real with myself, and I had to be open-hearted. And so one day, instead of just brushing it aside and saying there's no validity to this, it doesn't match my mindset enough to even explore it, I thought, well, maybe, just maybe, I am overlooking something with regard to Christianity. Maybe I've misinterpreted something that I believe about the Bible or believe about Jesus' teaching, so I thought it's only right if he did die on the cross for the sins of the human race and if he was the only incarnation of God in this world and allowed himself to go through that suffering to redeem me and bring me back to God, I thought I owe it to him to at least dedicate one day and to open my heart to his reality. And really, that's all it took. <laughs> so I set aside one day, and I said, Lord Jesus, I said, today is your day. It's just your day. all it took. <laughs> so I set aside one day, and I said, Lord Jesus, I said, today is your day. It's just your, I'm not going to do anything else except focus totally on you. And I started at 3.30 in the morning, and instead of doing my normal chanting and mantra yoga, 
I, I just started praying and reading the gospel and praying and reading the gospel. I spent 12 hours that day going between reading the Bible and praying, reading the Bible and praying. And the whole time I was saying, Jesus, I don't even know if you're there. I don't even know if we have a line of communication. But if you're there and if you died on the cross for the sins of humanity, show me today. This is your day. Prove yourself. Manifest yourself to me. That afternoon, I was hitchhiking. I looked a lot different back then, if you can imagine. I had hair down to about here and a long beard. And I was out on the road hitchhiking to go teach at University of South Florida. I had to hitchhike because I'd taken upon myself a, the discipline of poverty. And I own nothing except uh, one or two changes of clothes and a few eating utensils. And modeling myself, I suppose, after people like Mahatma Gandhi who... Uh, live that kind of life of self-denial, denying yourself material possessions. So I had to walk everywhere or hitchhike. And that afternoon I was hitchhiking to go teach at University of South Florida. One of the members of the prayer group, Kent Sullivan, was two miles away walking into a laundromat. He was a college student with an hour in between classes. And he just coincidentally happened to be a former student of yoga himself. And so he perfectly understood my mindset, and he knew exactly what the obstacles were to me intellectually in accepting Christianity. So he was the perfect choice, the perfect person for the job, and God sent him my direction. He was walking into this laundromat, and the Holy Spirit stopped him right in the door of the laundromat, and God said, don't go in there, get back in your van and start driving, and I'll lead you where you should go. And so he got behind the wheel and just started driving wherever he felt this desire or this inward whim to go and, and he drove about a quarter of a mile and then he felt that unction of the Holy Spirit and he turned and drove about another quarter of a mile and then he turned again and felt God move on his heart to make another turn. He made about four definite turns and drove to the very spot where I was hitchhiking and he told me he never picked up hitchhikers, never. That was just something he never did but he felt this overwhelming compulsion again to pick me up, not knowing that I'm standing there saying, Jesus, if you're the answer, this is still your day, show me. <laughs> and, and he pulled that van over to the side of the road, and I opened the door to the van, and my heart started racing because I looked inside, and on the ceiling of the van was a picture of Jesus that he had taped there. And I knew this is not coincidence. This is my answer. So I'm sitting on the edge of my seat waiting for something to happen. And he was a little new at witnessing, so he kind of beat around the bush talking about the weather and this and that for a few moments, and then <clears throat> cleared his throat and said, friend, can I ask you a question? I said, yes. He said, have you ever experienced Jesus coming into your heart? I said, no, but when can I? And he did a double take on that. He looked at me like, you're not supposed to give in that quick. You're supposed to discuss things for a while. He said, you can come to our prayer meeting tonight. I said, I don't want to wait for a prayer meeting. I said, if I can find Jesus, I want to find him right now. And so uh, he stopped the van. He pulled over into the first parking lot he came to. And God is so sweet to work things out. Because guess what kind of business establishment he pulled in front of? A laundromat. You know, that's where he'd been a little bit earlier that day trying to do his dirty clothes. When he saw the laundromat, his eyes lit up. He said, I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> and he went in and dumped his dirty clothes in and then came out. And, and we sat down in the back of the van, and I discussed with him some critical issues to me. I had some real difficult hurdles theologically to get over. And we discussed a few of them. I told him I could never believe that the Bible was literally the inspired word of God. And I told him I could never believe in a literal hell, and I could never give up my belief in reincarnation. And a list of different things that I felt were just impossible for me to either give up as a belief or embrace as a belief. And he kept brushing them aside, saying, don't worry about that. Just try Jesus. And I'd come up with another problem area. He'd say, don't worry about that. Just try Jesus. And I'd come up with another area of question. He'd say, don't worry about that. Just try Jesus. He kept emphasizing that point because he knew if I ever had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, that theology would take care of itself. Amen. That the mind and its ideas would come into divine order once the spirit is in a union with God. And so thank God he was wise enough not to get caught up in arguments or not arguments but discussions over different concepts. We knelt down in the back of the van 
I prayed a simple prayer. It seemed far too simple to me at the time. I just said, Lord, if you're there, and if you love me, and if you gave your life for me, and if this is the way to find God, then come into my heart right now, Jesus. I stumbled through it. I really didn't have a lot of faith because I really didn't believe in Christianity, but I believed in loving God. And I wanted to know God. And when I just opened the door, just cracked it a little bit with that confession and said, Jesus, if you're there and if this is all true, then come into my heart. He rushed in with his presence and his love. For the first time in my life, I literally felt the personal presence of God. I was transformed. I was born again. I received a spiritual rebirth of the spirit. And suddenly I was in a communion with God. I was, I was connected with my creator. And it was so profoundly real and undeniable that I went back that afternoon and the remainder of the week to all of my classes and told them that unknowingly I had misled them and that Jesus really is the only way, which was, which was quite shocking to about 400 students who felt that I was their guru. Uh, but uh, here I am out of a job now. Even though I didn't charge for my classes, they, they, some people would give offerings in a basket I'd leave at the back door. And that was enough to pay rent. Well, I didn't have that coming in anymore. So I had no place to stay, no money for food, nothing. But I had salvation, and that's what counted the most. And most of my main students became Christians also. And thankfully, one of them owned a barber shop. And for the next three weeks, he let me sleep on the floor of his barber shop, which was a hairy experience, to say the least. <laughs> I know I could have gone all day without saying that. But... uh. But then I moved to a Christian mission in Central Florida and worked there for six months. And then along with another brother, we gave away everything we owned and started hitchhiking around the country, preaching on college campuses and street corners during the Jesus Movement era in 1970 and on into the 70s. We traveled, well, 70s and 80s and 90s, we traveled, traveled all over the country and shared Jesus, not just in the church house, but out there where the people are that do not yet embrace Christianity. Now for a few minutes, and I don't really think we have a time limit on this session, uh, so I, I'm going to go as long as you're comfortable, and I'm comfortable with it. For a little while, I'm going to share with you some of the critical issues that I had to resolve after I found this experience of salvation through Christ to be true and real. And comparing my present beliefs with what I taught as a yoga teacher and what the guru I studied under taught me. In fact, the word guru comes from two words that mean one who brings you from darkness into light. And the word guru simply means teacher uh, or a teacher who brings you out of the darkness of religious deception into the light of the truth. And unfortunately, when I was a quote-unquote guru, I had not yet entered into the light myself, and so I couldn't draw others into the light. I experienced what seemed to be light, I had many out-of-body experiences during meditation. They call it astral projection, where I, I had the, the uh, I don't know if it was a literal happening or not, but I had the strong impression of my soul actually leaving my body and being in what they call an astral realm or a spiritual realm. And, and then I had an experience of white light, where I also was projected into this intense white light, which is supposed to be the experience of Christ consciousness. But once I had the experience of God, all of those experiences paled in comparison, and I realized that they were counterfeit experiences and not the real experience of the true and the living God. Now, prior to the salvation experience that I had, I was a very strong proponent of the idea that God is already within every human being. He's within the Hindu, he's within the Buddhist, he's within the Muslim, he's within the Christian, that there is a spark of divine life within every human being. That seemed very logical to me, very loving. It seemed like a very intolerant point of view to believe otherwise. But after I became a Christian, I realized through the experience that prior to that spiritual rebirth, the Spirit of God had not been inside of me. And that goes along with the Bible. In Isaiah 59, it says that your sins have separated you from your God in, inside of me. And that goes along with the Bible. In Isaiah 59, it says that your sins have separated you from your God. And so there is a division between the hearts of human beings and the Creator that can only be bridged through the washing of the blood of Jesus. When I said, Jesus, cleanse my sin by your blood, just wash away my sin, then God legally 
could enter back into me. So I realized that God is an external God prior to salvation, where previously I believed that God is an internal God prior to salvation. And the reason I embraced that idea was probably another concept that I had. In fact, let me, let me bring out something very important. In, in the book that I've written on this, In Search of the True Light, uh, in the beginning of the second section, I emphasize that there are three major areas of doctrine that are vitally important in any religion. It's, uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's symbolized by this triangle, and there's a burning bush in the middle of the triangle. And the points of the triangle represent three primary areas of information that each religion has to interpret. One is the nature of the universe, represented by this edge or, or this triangle, uh, and the nature of man, represented by this corner of the triangle, and the nature of God, represented by the top corner of, of the triangle. And if you get any of these wrong, then it's going to make your interpretation of the other two wrong. And see, my interpretation of the universe as a yoga teacher was pantheism. And pantheism is basically the belief that the universe is not a creation of God, but rather an emanation of God. That God emanated himself in the form of physical matter. So that that's not really stars and planets and asteroids and, and suns and solar systems, and galaxies. But all of that, and all of the things it contains, the trees, bushes, flowers, animals, human beings, it's all God veiling himself in the appearance of physical matter, but that's not really a cat, that's God expressing himself as a cat. That's not really a tree, that's God expressing himself as a tree. And the Hindus call it maya, that, that we relate to the world as being physically real, but it's really a delusion, it's maya. And, and that in order to be enlightened, you've got to realize that, that those things are eventually going to dissolve away into nothingness. And the phrase they use is, go back to Godhead. They will all eventually blend back in, in oneness with God. Now, I embrace that very wholeheartedly. I thought it to be a logical view of the universe, that God is uh, the life within everything. And that he's at the core of everything. Now... That's how I interpret the universe, or interpreted the universe as a yoga teacher. Now, if you interpret the universe that way, if you say everything is God, and that's what pantheism means, pantheism. Uh, the word pan means all, and theism comes from theos, which means God. All is God, and God is all. If pantheism is true, is if everything is God, then that's going to uh, affect your belief concerning the nature of man. Because it's not a quantum leap of logic to then say, if everything is God, we are God. Which is a belief uh, that you find in Hinduism, in philosophical Hinduism, that we are God. And also it's uh, very predominant in what we would call the New Age movement. That uh, every person in this room has a perfect right to the title, I am. I am that I am. That we all are eternally God in expression. Now, if I embrace that, there's a problem area with that idea. Because if I say we are God, that includes, look at the acronym now, W-E, the worst of the human race and the most excellent of the human race. It includes the Mother Teresas and it includes the Adolf Hitlers. Now, if all I had to look at were people with developed characters like Mother Teresa, I could almost fall prone to the idea that we are God in expression. But when you see a tyrant like Adolf Hitler, how can you explain that? How can you say we are all God when someone could be that vile and vicious and demonized? Well, you have to alter your view of the character of God then. So first you start out with a belief concerning the nature of the universe in one corner of the triangle. It affects your belief in the nature of man at the other corner. Now it's going to affect your belief in the nature of God. If we are God and we as human beings include both evil and good people, then the next jump of logic is there must be both good and evil in God. Which is actually what the yin-yang symbol represents. Look on the cover of the book. You'll see this symbol up in the upper right-hand corner. is the symbol of ancient Taoism, an ancient religion of China. 
And this is called the yin-yang symbol. A lot of people think it just represents the duality of male and female, and a lot of people wear it as a charm on a bracelet or something like that, thinking that's all it refers to. But it really refers to, first, the dualities you face in this world, uh, summer and winter, pleasure and pain, male and female, mountains and valleys, night and day. Life is full of dualities, joy and depression, hope and despair. We face them every day, and that's a correct observation. And Taoism centers its attention quite a bit on the balancing of all of these dualities you face in life, how to deal with it, how to react to it. And they come up with some good conclusions. But the, the jump of logic they take that is very wrong is their assumption is because this world is full of dualities, whatever or whoever brought it into existence must have a dual nature. And so in that belief system, God is not a he, God is an it, just an impersonal energy force that is both darkness and light, that is both evil and good. And we see that demonstrated even in some cultural things uh, that you're probably very well familiar with in our generation, like the movie Star Wars. Uh, actually, the man who created the Star Wars series did it primarily to impart to his generation his view of the nature of God, which is uh, like the Taoist view, that there is both good and evil in God. And uh, in, that, uh, in that particular show or series of shows, I've never seen them myself, but I've read enough about them to know basically what it's about. The villain is Darth Vader. Uh, oh, I got a response from over there. Oh, yes, the villain. <laughs> the villain is Darth Vader who draws his evil occultic power from quote-unquote the force and the hero is Luke Skywalker who draws his righteous power to withstand evil from the force they both have the same source for the power which is this impersonal energy force this cosmic energy that is ultimate reality in Taoism now can you see can you see how deceptive that is because the Bible says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, if pantheism is correct, if pantheism is correct, and I don't believe it is now, but if pantheism is correct, then you have to embrace the idea that there's darkness and light in God. If everything is an emanation of God, then both the negative and positive things that are in this universe are God in expression. It's necessary. If you attribute divinity to man, you must attribute sinfulness to God. And that's why in the Hindu pantheon of gods, as well as other religions that have a pantheon of many gods, you find those gods uh, manifesting very negative human-like traits that we would consider far less than the behavior pattern of quote-unquote deity. It's because of this foundational belief, see? If pantheism is true, then there must be good and evil in God. If theism is true, then God can exist apart from physical creation and maintain his integrity. And I, as a Christian, as a Bible believer, embrace theism now. The belief that God, though he created the universe, exists apart from it. And, of course, our feeble uh, effort to describe eternal realities with language sometimes falls short of fully describing these things the way they need to be described. But God exists apart, which sometimes falls short of fully describing these things the way they need to be described. But God exists apart from physical creation. Therefore, the evil that is here, the bad, the darkness that is here, cannot be attributed to him. See, it's the product of man. In his fallen state, it's the product of Satan and demonic powers that are subordinate to him that have infiltrated this realm. But God is not at fault. Man is at fault for the evil here. But God is holy. And God is untainted. And God is without flaw. Do you believe that? That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, can we say that truth is subjective? And that if you say you were a Taoist, were sitting there, and I was conversing with you, and I, a Christian, can we say, well, you can have you, your truth, and I can have my truth, and we can both be right simultaneously? That's something promoted very strongly on our college campuses and in our society right now. 
that is striving for tolerance. And I see to tolerance as a very important thing to strive toward if it means giving other people the right to believe what they believe without persecuting them for what they believe. And, and I believe it's very important to have that kind of tolerance where there's no racial prejudice and certainly there's no mistreatment of others uh, or coercion of conversion, uh, which unfortunately has happened in the history of Christianity. Uh, but I believe those who were very forceful in the way they coerced others into embracing Christianity were probably not Christians themselves. They may have embraced an idea of Christ, but they didn't have his nature. His nature is a nature of love and a nature of gentleness. Do you agree with that? Amen. But, but there is no, there is no uh, way, logically, in my thinking, that I could say that. That I could say, well, you can have your pantheistic belief, and I can have my theistic belief, and we can both be right simultaneously. Either pantheism is correct or theism is correct, but they can't both be correct. Now, there is a modified version of pantheism that is called panentheism, P-A-N-E-N-T-H-E-I-S-M. And that comes from original words uh, that mean God is in all. Pantheism is the idea that God is everything you see. Some people don't believe that necessarily the universe is God emanated, but they do believe God is the spark of life within every living thing. That's panentheism. But again, theism differentiates between natural life and divine life. See? In fact, in the Bible, there's two different words translated life. One is suke. It's spelled in the Greek P-S-U-C-H-E, suke. And for instance, Jesus said, take no thought for your suke. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall put on. For the life is more than meat. It's more than raiment. It's more than what you eat. It's more than what you wear. That's talking about natural life, human life. But when he was talking about divine life, he used a, di uh, a different word. Of course, he most likely spoke in Aramaic or Hebrew, but when it was translated into Greek, a different word is used because a different concept is being uh, transferred. He said, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Well, the Greek word is zoe, Z-O-E, which means eternal life, divine life, God life. I believe that was the life that Adam had when God breathed into him the breath of what? The breath of life. Well, did God breathe natural life into Adam? Well, maybe it happened simultaneously uh, with the inbreathing of the presence of God, but I believe that was much more than just gaseous vapors that filled up Adam's lungs so he would start breathing on his own. The breath of God is not necessarily just the, the gases that fill our atmosphere. Because God's not going to die of asphyxiation if he gets outside of the atmosphere. Well, when God breathes, what does he breathe? He breathes himself. His very divine essence. And I believe when he breathed into Adam's nostrils, Adam became a what? He became a living soul. A soul. A living soul. Wasn't necessarily talking about the physical body. He was talking in that instant, about the soul becoming alive with the presence of God. Now, when Adam transgressed, the breath of God took its departure. He was still a living physical body with a fallen soul that had a lot of death-dealing attributes about it, attitudes and, and, and things that crowded and clouded Adam's mind, like depression and fear and guilt and condemnation of himself and, and all the things that we face as soulless human beings. And the spirit of man, uh, the spirit of Adam, was for all intents and purposes dead. The Bible says we're dead in trespasses and sins, and that's primarily talking about the spirit part of us. See, there's three parts to you, the body, the soul, and the spirit. Each is a trinity within itself. The body is made up of flesh, bones, and blood. The soul is primarily made up of mind, will, and emotions. And the spirit is primarily made up of conscience, intuition, and communion with God. Through the Spirit, a man communes with God and receives revelation or intuition from God. And the conscience is also a part of the Spirit, which is that inward sense of what is morally right and morally wrong, and it carries with it the desire to do what is morally right. And when Adam fell, the soul plunged into darkness and started experiencing horrible things, 
lust, greed, pride, selfishness, hate, and the spirit was dragged down into the mire. Communion with God was cut off. Intuition was almost completely cut off. Every now and then in our lives, we get little glimpses of insights, but for the most part, they're distorted or wrong. Uh, they don't come from God. Every now and then, somebody may get a little bit of intuitive knowledge from God, but not much. And conscience is about the only part of your spirit that's still functioning, but it's like a barely burning ember where there used to be a raging fire of sensitivity to God. So you, can you see the problem with man? Man is in a state of separation from God, and his spirit is almost non-functional. But when a person is born again, praise God, he's instantly connected with God in communion with God, he is able to receive intuitive knowledge, revelation knowledge from God, and his conscience is purged from dead works to serve the living God, which is a biblical way of saying that the conscience is purged of the influence of the damage it received when we walk through a life of sin, and it's made sensitive to what pleases and displeases God again. So, so there's, there's your solution, see? The solution is God coming into you from without and repairing the damage that was done by Adam. Now remember, when Jesus appeared in the upper room after he was raised from the dead, the Bible said he breathed on his disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Then, in Acts chapter 2, it talks about the actual happening of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And it said, There came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind, like a wind. It was not a wind, but it was like a wind. And it was a sound from where? A sound from heaven, like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Cloven tongues of fire sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking with tongues. Now, I want you to notice the Bible did not say that this divinity was awakened from within. It said the Holy Spirit came into them from without. And I'm still going over this very important point because it's an essential and fundamental thing that we've got to get our grips on. Uh, now, one of the other has got to be true. The guru I studied under taught us that in every human being is something called the kundalini. How many of you have never heard of that idea of the kundalini? Raise your hand. How many have? Raise your hand. Very, very few. Just maybe one here, and I thought I saw one other hand go back, uh, go up over there. The kundalini is also referred to as the serpent power because what is taught in Hinduism and what is promoted uh, by the gurus and swamis that come over in the Western world is the idea that there is a coiled, latent, dormant energy at the base of the spine, which is that spark of divinity supposedly within every human being, that through meditation is unleashed, and like a serpent striking, it strikes the third eye, and, uh, and that's when a person achieves God consciousness. And I won't go through all the details of the wording that's used, but anyway, it, it seems quite strange to me that it's called the serpent power. Because we as Bible believers know that a serpent represents evil. In the New Age, though, a serpent represents esoteric wisdom. Wisdom that is withheld from the masses and only known by a few enlightened persons. See, a serpent represents wisdom. And they even uphold that, that symbol by referring to Jesus' statement where he said, Be wise as a serpent and harmless as doves. Wisdom. And they even uphold that that symbol by referring to Jesus' statement where he said, be wise as a serpent and harmless as doves. And, and so they'll try to support what they believe by that statement. But the overall use of the symbol in Scripture uses a serpent to represent that which is evil. Now, when I was a, a student of yoga, my whole focus through meditation, through yoga, through various disciplines was to hopefully awaken the kundalini to achieve God consciousness. But strangely, I was told by some of the gurus I studied under that it's a very dangerous thing to do prematurely. That if you awaken the kundalini prematurely, it can cause insanity. It can cause experiences with demonic-like creatures. And, and it can cause very dark occultic powers. Now, after I became a Christian, I realized something, that there is no account in the Bible of the Spirit of God moving on anyone to their detriment. No one had an experience with God that caused them to go insane. No one had a personal encounter with God that caused them to have visions 
uh, of demonic-like creatures and, and be overtaken by those demonic forces. No, quite the contrary. Anyone that had an experience with God was only edified by it. So what power is being unleashed? What is this kundalini power? Now, I will clearly define it as demonic intrusion of a person's life. Falsifying an experience of God because the Bible says Satan can appear as an angel of light and his ministers can appear as ministers of righteousness. Let me show you something else. In the book, I deal with this idea of the kundalini. And I, I want to read to you some really frightening things uh, about the supposed release of the kundalini. Dangerous side effects is what it's under. Uh, this is written, uh, this is a, a personal account of the supposed awakening of the kundalini by a very popular guru back in the 70s and 80s. I, I think he's uh, died since then. I, I don't think he's alive anymore. There's something different about Jesus, too. He died, and three days later, he got up again and <laughs> said, Behold, I'm alive forevermore. And none of the grooves I ever studied under have come out of the grave after having died. But Swami Muktananda said this. Uh, this was his experience with the awakening of the Kundalini. Listen. Uh, he encountered a naked ascetic. An ascetic is a, a, like a wandering sadhu, a person who uh, completely denies himself, and all he does is seek after ultimate reality. And Swami Muktananda uh, encountered a naked ascetic who was blissfully meditating on top of a pile of human excreta. Now, why would anybody sit on a manure pile to meditate? Because uh, it was part of his way, and, and there's a, a logical reason for it. It was part of his way of overcoming the delusion of the physical world because everything is an expression of God, even the excreta. And, and so that would be one of the reasons he would do that. But anyway, this Hindu ascetic was meditating on top of a pile of human excreta, and he invited the man who would later be known as Swami Muktananda to come and sit on his lap and lick his head. And the ascetic then proceeded to initiate Muktananda into Kundalini Yoga. Later that day, Muktananda explained, My mind seemed deluded. I felt I would soon become insane. My entire body started aching. The tongue began to move down the throat, and all attempts to pull it out failed. My fear grew. I felt a severe pain in the knot below the navel. I tried to shout but could not even articulate. Next, I saw ugly and dreadful demon-like figures, and I thought them to be evil spirits. Suddenly, I saw a large ball of light approaching me from the front. It merged into my head, and I was terrified by the powerfully dazzling light. An encounter with God? No. An encounter with God doesn't make you feel insane. An encounter with God is nothing but peace that passes understanding. Well, what was it then? It was an encounter with a false spirit impersonating the presence of God or a deceptive experience with a force or a power meant to be interpreted as being God. When you meet the true and the living God, you'll know the difference until you... Eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. All of my attempts at describing the way it sticks to the roof of your mouth and the way it tastes are in vain. You have to have the experience to understand it. And in like manner, I cannot explain to you what this experience of God is like. You've got to have that experience. Like Kent Sullivan told me, don't worry about those issues you're all worried about. Try Jesus. Amen. Try Jesus. Just try Jesus. All right, let me explain something to you. Again, uh, on this issue of whether or not truth is relative. What if, what if you had two astronomers talking their theories out? What if one of them was Ptolemy, who lived around the second century, who taught that the world uh, was, that the earth was the center of the solar system, and that the sun revolved around the earth, and that was such a popular popular belief that you chanced, that, that was such a popular belief, you chanced being killed if you offered an opposite point of view. And that's why a thousand years later, uh, Copernicus came along, and, and he waited to the end of his life to offer a heliocentric view, that no, the sun is the center of the solar system, because he knew he might be killed for his belief. 
What if they could be seated in the same room? Could Copernicus say to Ptolemy, you can have your belief and I can have my belief and we can both be right simultaneously. Truth is subjective. Truth is not objective. It's not the same for everyone. You can have your interpretation of the solar system and I can have mine. Of course, anyone in the room would say, that's illogical. That one has to be right at the expense of the other view being wrong. Well, the same is true concerning this that I've discussed up to this point. Either theism is correct or pantheism is correct, but they can't be both right simultaneously. One has to be right at the expense of the other being wrong. Do you agree? That's an important point. There's some other things that I discovered after I became a Christian. As I began to search through the Bible and really inspect some things. The guru I studied under, for instance, he used to teach that Jesus' death on the cross did not provide atonement. But he used the same letters and yet hyphenated the phrase at one mint, A T O N E M E N T, at one mint instead of atonement. He said Jesus' death on the cross demonstrated at one mint his oneness with God that forced him to fulfill his destiny, even if it meant death. But the guru I studied under taught that Jesus' death could not provide atonement for sin. It could not cleanse anyone of their sin. It was all an example of obedience. But there's something else my guru taught me that eventually caused me to reevaluate everything he taught and discard a lot of it. He taught that Jesus was an avatar. How many have heard of the word avatar? Uh, how many don't know what it means? The word avatar is a Hindu word that means a manifestation of God or an incarnation of God. And in Hindu theology, well, there's a lot of different lists in various sacred books. One list says there's been 22 avatars. Another uh, gives another number. I guess they've kind of resolved it to a, about 10 in number. There's been 10 avatars. Uh, most will agree on that. Uh, of course, Jesus is not included in that list of ten necessarily, and so it's a, a flexible belief. It can bend uh, uh, the direction of whoever wants to use the term. A lot of people have claimed to be avatars, uh, e even in our generation. But uh, the guru I studied under taught that Jesus was an avatar. He was an incarnation of God. Therefore, he said everything he taught, everything he said was pure truth because an avatar can only speak truth. My spirit lit up on that one. After I became a Christian, I remembered that. And I thought, well, if all he could speak was truth, then I need to inspect what he said. Because if it has to be truth, then I found an irrefutable source of information that I can depend on. And I went to his teaching, and much to my surprise it started chopping away at all of these beliefs I had promoted as a yoga teacher. For instance, one thing he said, when he passed the cup at the Last Supper to his disciples, instituting the communion ritual, which actually grew out of the uh, Passover ritual, uh, he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for many as an example of obedience. Is that what he said? No. He didn't say this is a demonstration of at one minute. He said this is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Wow. I'll say it backwards. Wow. That's intense. That if one who could not speak a lie, the incarnation of truth itself, passed a cup and said, this represents the blood that I'm shedding for the human race, which is for the remission of sins. Either that man is insane and an egomaniac, or what he's saying involves the most phenomenal event that's ever taken place on planet earth. And I would dare to say the latter of the two is the correct, that the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ is the pivot. It is the hinge on which creation turns, and it was the thing through which and by which you and I can be forgiven of our sins. Praise God. He said it. I believe it. And when I connected with the truth, it happened in my life. 
I'm forgiven now. My sins are gone. My sins are gone. Now, when you start dealing with that issue, you've got to deal with the idea of reincarnation. Now, remember, I told Larry, who initially wrote me that letter in the beginning and, and told me I uh, needed to find Jesus, that I could never give up my belief in reincarnation. In, in my book, In Search of the True Light, I described 13 reasons why I no longer embrace the idea of reincarnation. And one of them, one of the most important ones, is that reincarnation does not allow for forgiveness coming from God. Not really. Not a strict view of reincarnation. It involves paying off your karmic debt. You have good karma. You have bad karma. Every action brings forth a reaction according to the law of karma. And if you do something bad in this life, you pay for it either later in that life or in another life yet to come in your future. For instance, to use an example, if you beat your wife in this life, chances are you'll be born in the next life as a woman who is constantly beaten by her husband, and therefore you pay off your karma. And uh, that kind of idea, some of you women are looking at your husbands right now. You, I know I can almost read those thoughts you're saying, better be careful how you treat me, honey. But see, uh, if that be true then this inexorable law is overshadowing you where you have to pay off all of your sin. You have to somehow uh, achieve absolution, if you will, or achieve freedom from your sin through your own effort. You work out your karma. And that's why people devoted to yoga will spend a lifetime trying to do their best to rid their life of all negativism, to rid their life even to the point where, uh, of course, with the belief in reincarnation comes the belief that the soul passes through animal stages on its way to human stages, if you believe in progressive reincarnation. And so all of life is very sacred to a person who believes in Eastern religions. So we wouldn't even kill animals. Some very passionate people about that concept are Janus, who will, uh, some of them will even sweep the sidewalk in front of them for fear of killing small insects when they walk down the sidewalk because they want to hallow uh, human life or they want to uh, value, uh, not human life, but they value life in whatever form it's in uh, for fear of getting any negative karma that they then have to pay off, see? Well, when you really realize that every breath you take, you're breathing in microorganisms, every uh, drink of water you take, you're drinking in microorganisms, and, and there's all kinds of negative things happening all the time. You, there's no way you can pay that off. I'll never forget the first yoga ashram that we bought or uh, that we started a, um, a yoga ashram at. We rented, rather. We rented this yoga ashram, this building, to have a yoga ashram there. We didn't know it was infested with fleas. Oh, it was infested. We rented this house, and we were going to set up yoga classes there, and we started meditating the first morning. And honestly, a hundred fleas must have jumped on me. They were biting me on my scalp, on my arms, on my legs. I was doing my best to ignore. I couldn't pinch them and kill them, or I'd reap all that negative karma. You know, I didn't want to kill. That thing may evolve and be an uncle or an aunt later on in the reincarnation chain, you know. So for three days, we endured all these fleas. And then after three days of misery, we backslid and went and bought a can of black flag and killed every flea in the house. We said, karma or no karma, they're going. Well, we were sincere in believing that. But see, if you lived a million lives, and did your best to rid your life of every sinful tendency, every sinful thought, every sinful attitude, you'd never achieve your goal. There's never been a perfect human being that has lived a flawless life. You need more than self-effort in uh, attaining or achieving union with God. You need forgiveness. An impersonal life force cannot forgive you. See, in Hinduism, ultimate reality is Brahman. B-R-A-H-M-A-N. Brahman is the ultimate force that underlies all things. And out of Brahman comes this multiplicity of gods. The, the traditional figure is 330 million gods in Hinduism. 
which is not an exact figure. It's just used to show how many gods can exist within Hinduism. And all of these personal gods supposedly emerge from Brahman, who is the absolute. And Brahman is a non-seeing, non-hearing, non-responsive, cosmic energy that you do not pray to, but rather you meditate on so that divinity can be awakened within you. But you don't pray to Brahman because Brahman won't respond. Brahman is not a personal God. God is an impersonal life force on the ultimate level in Hinduism and in a lot of those things that have stemmed from Hinduism, like the New Age movement. Ultimate reality is nothing more than a cosmic energy. Now, there's two big problem areas from that way of interpreting the Godhead. Number one, it makes God subservient to man. Then God is controlled by the right incantation or the right... Um, chant or mantra. You control the energy force to release it the way you want. God becomes subservient to man. Uh, Jesus refuted that way of doing things. He said, use not vain repetitions like the heathen do. Use not vain repetitions like the heathen do. That is very plain. I taught as a yoga teacher that according to the Gnostic gospel and according to the uh, Aquarian gospel and according to the uh, prophecies of Edgar Cayce, primarily the prophecies of Edgar Cayce in the Aquarian gospel, that the hidden years between 13 and 30, that Jesus spent those years in India, studying under the Indian gurus, learning how to awaken his Christ nature, and then after he fully emerged as the Christ through 17 years of, of yogic discipline that he came back empowered to fulfill his call as the Messiah. Well, why did he come back and tell us not to use the methods they use? Why did he say use not vain repetitions? Because God is not an impersonal energy force. If that was true, if God on the highest level was an impersonal energy force, it would make sense to chant mantras. Because if it's not a personal being that will respond to you and interact with you and commune with you. Sure, you can say the same thing 10,000 times and not bore them to death. Well, you couldn't bore God to death, of course. But what I'm trying to say is, well, what about a fellow human being? If some of you women wanted your husband to take the trash out, would you chant it to him? When he comes in the kitchen, would you say, please take the garbage out, please take the garbage out, please take the garbage out, please take the garbage out. By the fifth or sixth time she says that, the garbage may go over her head. You know, I'm an intelligent human being. You only have to tell me one time, honey. Well, when we communicate with other fellow human beings, if you don't have to go through this mindless reputation, I have a feeling God's more intelligent than any of us. I don't believe you have to go through mindless repetition in communicating with God. Just talk to him like he's the best friend you've ever had. I said, just talk to him like he's the best friend you've ever had. Of course, there's a movement in entity now called contemplative prayer. And in some circles, not everyone does this, but they'll give you a meditative word that you're supposed to chant it, maybe a biblical word or even the name of the Lord, and you chant it in a sing-song kind of way or a monotonous, monotone kind of way. Uh, in order to achieve a mindless state where you can have mystical experiences. That's not biblical. And it's really using a method that stems out of Buddhism and Hinduism and trying to incorporate it into Christianity. Jesus never taught that uh, prayer method, and you should not participate in it because it will bring on experiences that are not from God. And that's the truth. So there's a big issue right there, just the chanting of mantras. Uh, Jesus said, don't do it. He said, when you pray, pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Those are very intelligent ideas, a stream of ideas being communicated to God. And he never intended for people just to quote the Lord's Prayer over and over again ritualistically. He said, pray on this wise. In other words, approach God with these kind of ideas and appeals to him. Praise him. Enter into his gates with praise. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallow his name. Celebrate his name first. And then pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Surrender to his kingship, his lordship. Submit to him. But he never taught repetitious prayer. Probably one of the most important 
things I need to bring out and the difference between what I believed as a yoga teacher and what I believe now is the difference between reincarnation and resurrection. Jesus did not teach reincarnation. Let me say that again. Jesus did not teach reincarnation. As a yoga teacher, I taught that he taught reincarnation. I instructed people quite often that uh, reincarnation is biblical. Jesus taught it to his disciples. How can you prove that? I would try to prove it by what he said concerning John the Baptist. He said, this is Elijah, which was to come. And also there's another scripture in the New Testament that said John the Baptist came in the spirit. Everybody say the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now, interpreted on the surface, that sounds like he was saying that the spirit that was in Elijah reincarnated in the form of of John the Baptist. But when you compare, and correct exegesis of any biblical scripture involves comparing all references to the same subject. Then you come up with what God is trying to say. And when you compare all the references that deal with Elijah, you'll find out something much different is being communicated. Because for instance, when Elijah ascended into heaven in a fiery chariot, first of all, he was assumed both body, soul, and uh, of course, spirit, his whole being, body, soul, and spirit, were taken up into a heavenly sphere. So if his body was taken to a heavenly sphere, how could he be reincarnated because he never lost his body to start with? That would be one obese person to have another body inside of your body. That would be a real problem. And I'm speaking tongue-in-cheek. But first of all, he didn't lose his physical body. His body was just made, I believe, into a heavenly or glorified form. Secondly, when or right before he was taken up into heaven, Elisha, his protege, said, when God takes you, let a double portion of your what? Of your spirit be upon me. And it happened where the spirit of Elijah doubled, rested on Elisha. In that instance... The spirit of Elijah was not a reference to literally his personal soul or his personal spirit, but rather the anointing that rested upon Elijah was then transferred to Elisha. And later on, that same anointing, the spirit of Elijah that was transferred to Elisha, was again transferred to John the Baptist, who fulfilled a similar purpose, where Elijah came to restore right religion in a day when idolatry was abounding in Israel and they were embracing all these wrong religious beliefs and false gods and Elijah got them centered again on the correct view of God and, and got them back to the basics of real religion and that's what John the Baptist did he, he pushed aside all of these pharisaical traditions and got back to the basics again to restore the people back to true religion the spirit of Elijah rested upon him if you take everything together Jesus never taught that John the Baptist was actually Elijah reincarnated, but rather that he was the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy that Elijah shall come first before that great notable day of the Lord and before the Messiah comes. But he came in the sense that his anointing and his power was on John the Baptist. He was not literally John the Baptist reincarnated. Very important point, extremely important point. Uh, another thing I should cover with regard to this is the difference between reincarnation and resurrection. In the doctrine of reincarnation, it is taught that the highest part of you, the highest self, is one with Brahman. It's called Atman, A-T-M-A-N. And Atman is one with Brahman. And most people are not consciously aware of that part of their being. They live lives identifying with their jiva, J-I-V-A, and it means the personalized part of you in an incarnation where you relate to your name, your family, your race, your, uh, your country, your nation that you're part of. You identify yourself these ways. You don't identify yourself as this being who is one with God. You're locked into this physical consciousness, and you go through life that way, okay? And, and that these personal beings are discarded on the evolutionary journey of the soul. And the, so these personal beings don't really have ultimate value. They're discardable because they're experiences you have during the chain of 
reincarnations that mold and shape your character on your way to perfection. And so it, in, in de-emphasizing the value of each person during this chain of reincarnations, you actually devalue individuals. And that's why there can be massive suffering in a land like India. And some of the gurus just teach that the answer really is, is not building hospitals and taking care of people because they're just suffering for karma uh, incurred through negative things they've done in their past lives. See? And, and the answer is withdrawal. Withdraw from it. Close yourself off into a world of meditation where you can become one with your higher self and escape suffering. And I understand that view. I understand their w reason for reacting that way. But that's not the answer. Because Jesus values the individual. You're not just one in a chain of many lives that are discardable until you reach oneness with this impersonal force. And the scary thing, and I will use the word scary, is that if your ultimate destiny is to discard all your personal existences and become one with an impersonal force, then your ultimate uh, essence of being will be impersonal also. Which is not progression, it is digression. Think of that. Jesus did not teach reincarnation. He said, he that believeth on me, he said, uh, this is the will of him that sent me, that of all that he's given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. He taught that your physical body would literally be resurrected. Now, I know that to thinking people, resurrection seems utterly stupid. Why? Because what about somebody that gets buried at sea, and the fish and the sharks eat their bodies, and then hundreds of fishes swim different directions, and they die and get eaten by hundreds of crabs that crawl away, that get eaten by some other creature that goes different directions and before long little pieces of your body are scattered all over the ocean floor how in the world can God resurrect that well that'll be a job for him won't it well the thing is he doesn't need your whole body he only needed a handful of dust when he started and made Adam in the beginning he would only need a microscopic little piece of what your body was to reshape and bring forth a glorified body in the end for you. Uh, why does he need, why does he need that physical material? It doesn't seem logical. I admit it, it doesn't seem logical. Just because he chooses to. And I think the reason he chooses to is to show his power over what looks like something worthless. He could have created Adam without resorting to using the material dust. But he wanted to use a worthless substance to create his creature of highest worth. And he could give you a, a celestial form without even using any of the substance of what was your physical body. But he chooses not to do it that way. And if it pleases God, it's okay with me for him to do it. However he wants to get me to a glorified state, I believe that my ultimate destiny as a Christian is to have a form. Now, as a, as a guru, as a teacher of yoga, I believe that my ultimate destiny was to be a formless part of a universal oversoul where I blended in with Brahman and become one, became one with this cosmic power. But I would be formless. I would have no definite body. But now I believe that you and I, if we see Jesus when he comes back again and we're changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be brought forth as glorified saints of the Most High, shining in the kingdom of God like the sun. The Bible said there will be such brilliance, such radiance emanating from us. We will shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. We'll have glorified bodies in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. One last thing. One last thing. There's a lot of talk about Jesus and Buddha being brothers. You know, there's a lot of books at Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, that celebrate the idea that Jesus and Buddha were brothers. I believe Buddha, actually I believe Buddha was a very good man that really had high ideals. He was born into a royal family. He saw through all the phoniness of the life that he was confronted with all the time, all the fickleness and, and the self-centeredness uh, of being so wealthy and surrounded by people that were so poverty-stricken. He just couldn't handle that kind of life, and he left and became an ascetic and, and spent many, many years meditating, trying to find ultimate reality. I believe he was really sincere. I believe if he had lived in the days in which Christianity was preached, he would have become a Christian because he was not satisfied with just temporal existence. But anyway, he arrived at some conclusions. 
One conclusion he arrived at is that man has no soul. That man is made up of five parts that disassemble at death. But there's no such thing as an enduring soul or personal self that endures beyond death. And he said, you've got to give up your, pers your belief in a personal soul, and you've got to give up your belief that that soul can have a personal existence in a heavenly state in order to achieve nirvana. Well, how could Jesus and Buddha be on the same plane when Jesus taught you definitely have a personal soul and that you definitely can spend eternity in heaven? Are both right? Can both sit in a room and say, well, your beliefs are pretty good. My beliefs are pretty good. Why don't we say they're both truth? Of course not. Either you have a soul or you don't have a soul. Either you can spend eternity in heaven or you won't spend eternity in heaven. Which is right. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. The word nirvana, which is the ultimate state for a Buddhist, is a word that means the blowing out of a candle. It means cessation of personal existence. Where you, in a personal sense, cease to be. I don't believe that's what Jesus taught. Quite the contrary, he taught that you as a person have great value to God and God wants to spend eternity communion with you. But it comes through the washing of the blood of Jesus and the experience of being born again. I may not have convinced you. You may say, well, I don't know if I believe I embrace what you've taught here today. You know what my response is? Don't worry about it. Try Jesus. <laughs>